Hi, I'm Mark Shasha. I'm a painter from New England. I live on the North Shore of Boston, and I'm so excited to be here. I'm going to be doing a painting today of golden light and water, and we're going to put some boats in it and lots of texture. It should be an interesting challenge, and I hope you'll come along for the ride and take it step by step with me. Let's do this. Okay, so let's talk about some of the materials that I'm going to be using in this painting to make this picture. We're going to start with seagull feathers, which I simply found at the beach. They're random. You can use any feathers that you happen to have. Sea sponges. I recommend that you use real sea sponges and not the uh, artificial ones. Palette knives. I have a variety. A couple of bristle brushes. These are inexpensive brushes from the local hardware store. Nothing fancy there. I also have a variety of other brushes. We have a fan brush and some rounds and a couple of flats. I also have some rubber tipped color shapers. Here's a bottle brush. This will be handy when we start doing some of the foliage. And also for foliage textures, I like to use straw and I make my own brushes using Velcro strips like this, cutting some of the uh, straw up and making my own brushes. Some straight edges, pencils, my value scale, and some uh, very absorbent paper towels. I recommend something like Viva that's, that's very absorbent and uh, a mall stick which is going to hold my arm steady when I get into the detail work. So there's some of my tools that I'm going to be using now. Let's flip around and we'll talk about some of my paints. I don't really have a particular way of organizing my paints so uh, I'll just tell you what I have out here. I've kind of clustered them in groups. We have uh, some earth tones here and warms and some cools later. We have here in this corner is some titanium white. Here is some raw umber, transparent red oxide, yellow ochre, raw sienna. This is Naples yellow, Indian yellow, cadmium yellow, lemon yellow, cadmium orange, cadmium red light, alizarin, rose matter, viridian, permanent green light, green earth, olive green, ultramarine blue, Cobalt blue, cerulean blue, phthalo blue, and violet. So that's my palette. And now let's talk about why I chose this scene. So why did I choose this scene? Um, this is a plein air painting that I did on a beach in New England. And uh, what I want to talk to you about today is how to make light move across the painting and I want to talk about making the textures look natural. I think the plein air painting I have here is fine except it's missing something that will help me talk about lighting and, and uh, texture uh, a little more and that's a boat. I'd like to put a boat into the scene for a few reasons. Uh, as I say, it'll help us to establish scale and give us some sense of distance that helps to talk about the light. Also it'll give me something to reflect in the water. A lot of my students ask me how do you deal with water? How do you reflect things in it? How do you make those reflections convincing? The boat will help me do that. Also the sails of the boat are going to reinforce that golden light and what the nature of that light is. Um, so those are the dominant reasons why I want to put a boat in this painting. 
So now we're going to this digital image of two scenes and you can see that I've got a boat in each of them and the one on the left has more sand. Uh, I've decided, however, to use more of the design on the right which has more sky. The reason for that is so that we can play around with the sky a little bit and uh, show how we emphasize that golden light as it moves down from the sky and through the sails of the boat. A little more emphasis on sky rather than sand. So enough with the introductions, let's move on and get started with the drawing. All right, so the next step is to get into the drawing. So as we get into the drawing, I want to first take a look at the value study that I did. It is designed to show us not only where the boat's going to be, but also maybe a couple of other boats that we may put in the painting. The purpose of the value study is to figure out where the lights and darks are going to be in the painting. And it's also very helpful in giving us a sense of where the textures might be. As you can see, I did a little something with the sky. We'll have some clouds up there, nothing too dark, but something to pick up the light as it moves down and across the picture. And let's get ready. I think we're ready to go. So to get started here, I have a 16 by 20 canvas and it is prepared with some gesso. I've got two coats of gesso on that. And the reason I have two coats of gesso is so that it's smooth enough for me to draw a little bit on it, but it's also rough enough so that it'll pick up some paint. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is put in the horizon. As I look at my references, I have plenty of sky. That was an important part of why we did the drawing the way we did. So I'm going to bring the horizon in this painting down about seven inches from the top. And again, this is a 16 by 20 painting. So we're taking off, it's about a third of the way down. And that's my horizon line. And here we're going to take, I, I want to have the lip of that dune where the we're not really seeing where the water meets the sand. We're actually meets, there's a dune that's, we're kind of looking over at the scene that we have. So I want to put a lip on that edge and I'm just going to draw something a little bit random. Not going to make it a straight line. It goes across like this. Something like that. Now, we're going to put grass on this lip and we're going to let the grass come up a little bit. I'm not going to draw in every blade of grass. That's not the plan. We're simply going to indicate approximately how high these grasses are going to be in the underpainting once I get going with the underpainting. I just want to mark out where some of these blades of grass might go and about how high they are. Now, I like a painting that invites you in. So I'm going to have a path. We're going to make this path uh, coming up from here on the kind of on the bottom left and move up across toward this direction. And we're going to let this be the, the very lit area of the water. So I'm going to carve out a path. I think it ought to be about right here. Kind of. something like this and so there's a slope coming down like this and then it comes up a little like that and then comes back down and on either side of this path there's going to be grass there's going to be some foliage and I want to indicate where the lifts are in the dune which are going to carry the grass so there's going to be grass on this piece and just as I have in the sketch that you've, you've been looking at, I have grass on the right side as well and there's some indication of where the shadows are going to be. The light is very important as we've discussed in this 
in this, this uh, project. The light is coming from up here. It's going to be moving across the painting. I have to anticipate that. I'm looking at the value study very carefully and I see that this side of the grass is going to be casting is going to be cast shadow. The light coming this way is going to be casting a shadow as the grasses pop up over here. And grasses over here are going to be casting a shadow down this way. So all I want to do now in this stage is mark out where the path is. And I'm going to give, you're going to see me do some jagged edges here. These are just little dips in the sand, little lifts and little footprints in the sand that are going to add to the, um, it's going to be part of the texture of our scene, the texture of the sand. And I want to indicate here and there some jagged edges where we're going to have shadow and light just to give us some sense of the, where the values are going to be. I'm not going to fill in those values now. I'm going to wait until I get to the underpainting and you'll see what I'm talking about. These jagged edges are kind of random. Just, it's, it's not important at this stage exactly where the jagged things are going. Uh, I just want to make sure that I leave room for that path. Okay, the next step is the boat. And I think we're going to put in more than one boat. I'm going to put in that dominant boat that we talked about. It's a schooner. And a schooner has two or more uh, masts. The effort here is going to be on the painting of the light. The eff this is a painting about how to paint light and how to paint texture. I don't want to spend a lot of time on the boat in a way that turns this into a painting about how to paint boats. So what we are going to do are we're going to put the convincing characteristics that are going to give us the contours of that schooner. And I'm going to show you how to do that. But we're not going to go into all the rigging and all the kind of finer points of the schooner. The schooner is far enough off the coast uh, because it's doing a job for us in this painting. It's giving us a sense of distance. If the schooner were any closer to us, then yes, we'd have to go into those details. But I want to make sure that we have a convincing, effective boat in this painting. I have hundreds of sketches of boats. And I've been doing drawings of boats for years, of course. And uh, sketchbooks full of boats, very handy for a situation like this. Now, one of my sketchbooks happens to have a schooner in it. So here's a, uh, a drawing that I've done of a schooner that I think will suit our purposes. It has sharp enough detail, and we can make some of the details sharper later. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you now how I transfer a drawing onto a canvas. The reason I want to do it with tracing paper, which is what I'm going to do, is so that I don't beat up my canvas in an effort to replicate something and then draw and erase and draw and erase. You can really scratch up the surface of your canvas that way. I don't want to do that. Instead, we're going to do it this way. I'm going to simply trace the boat onto a piece of tracing paper and then transfer that onto the canvas, which is a lot more sensitive. I place this piece of tracing paper over my boat. Then I use a pencil, doesn't have to be anything fancy. A number two pencil is fine. Then take a clear straight edge. You're going to need to see through it. You'll see why. I'm going to take it one step at a time. Make sure that I get these lines nice and sharp right on the edges of my boat. This is the mainsail of the schooner. There are some seams on the boat, on the sail, which I may draw in, we'll see. Here's the mast. So if you've got a clear straight edge, 
that helps you position, especially when you've got something detailed like a boat. So here's the aft of the boat, the back, and that goes down into the water. And here we have a, the bow, has a little clipper bow, it just turns right into the water right there straight. And then the bottom of the boat is in the water, so it's a straight line right there, just goes right across. These sails are called the fore sails. And they're tied, each one is tied with lines. We don't need to get into the details of all the rigging, as I said before. This is, we just want to get that, that beautiful silhouette, the contours of the boat. Another nice reason to put a boat in the drawing is that it gives us a contrast of a man-made object in our scene against all that organic stuff, all those organic textures. I think I've got everything, so I'm just going to put in some of these seams too. Let's put the seams in. Well, let's start down here. Each piece of the sail is sewn into the other piece very tightly here. And most sailboats, especially schooners, will have seams in their sails that you can see. I don't know how many of these seams we'll put in our painting, but we have the mast here that goes up to here. And we've got a flag kind of right off the top of that. Gives us a little sense of some wind. And there's lots of little stuff going on on the boat which we don't need to get into here. We can put that in when we do the painting. And you can see there's a horizon line and I might as well draw that in as well. Now the next step is to remove the tracing paper, turn it around and retrace all these lines with a softer pencil. Let's do that next. Simply find a blank white surface. In this case, I'm going to use another page of my sketchbook. I'm going to turn the tracing paper around and tape it. Tape it down nice and firmly so that it doesn't move around. And with a sharp pencil, with a sharp soft pencil, I'm going to retrace these lines. The mast ends about here. Okay, there's the boat. We're just retracing the lines that are on the other side. Take the time to get as precise as you can. You're really just going over lines that are already there and very obvious. Now we have the basic components and you can see on that blank page the first version of my drawing has now appeared. It's been rubbed right off onto that. So now we're ready to take this tracing and put it on the canvas. All right so now we've done our tracing and now it's time to apply it to the canvas. What I do is we take our little uh, tracing of a boat and we can look for exactly where we want it in the painting. Um, move it to the left or the right here. 
I think this is approximately what I've got in my sketchbook, in my little, it's what I've got in my value study. So I'm just going to tape it right there and tape it right here. And the reason you want to tape it is so that it doesn't move around while you do this. You're going to take your harder pencil, a HB or, or harder, and basically draw back over all of these lines and try to do it firmly, but not enough to hurt your canvas. And you don't have to be as precise here. You can kind of rub it right over where you were, like that. And the reason you don't need to be precise is because the line on the other side is already precise. Okay? You're really just rubbing that graphite onto the canvas directly. Just use the pencil. You don't need to apply too much pressure. Don't, don't damage your canvas doing this because the whole point of this process is to make it easier on your canvas and make it easier on you. I'm just doing one mast at a time here. There's the flag. There's the top of the sail on the second sail. And we're going to do the bottom here, which is the boom. And the seams, just rubbing this in. And uh, whoops, I got a little bit of motion there. <laughs> the tape didn't quite hold, but it's, it's OK. I'm just going to get a little more tape while I'm at it. It's not, my tape's not as sticky as I want it to be. That's okay, that ought to do it. <laughs> and now I'm just going to go right down the lines here. I'm confident that the lines on the other side of this tracing paper were carefully drawn so I can rub the I can rub these lines pretty tight. All right. Here's the bow of the boat. I'm going to get both lines at the same time. Come down the clipper bow. Just go along the water here and that tape wants to roll right up there. All right. All right. So you get the idea. Now when I take this piece of paper off, there should be a boat on my canvas. Let's, let's give it a test. And there it is. Voila. And we have one boat. I think we're going to do a couple of other boats. So I'm going to draw them in freehand. But first, I'm going to restate these lines. You might get a little tired of drawing the boat. <laughs> but the boat is now on your canvas. And that's very, very convenient. Because now you can work on it and you don't have to worry about making a mistake and erasing all over your canvas and making a big smudgy mess. So I'm just drawing back in to the lines that I had from my tracing. They're all here. And it takes a lot of pressure. It takes a lot of pressure off when you can do the drawing without damaging your, your uh, canvas. And there's the boat. Mission accomplished. <laughs> so we have one boat down on the canvas. And I want to put a couple of other boats because this one looks a little lonely. So here we go. They'll be smaller and they'll be off in the, uh, a little in the distance. I'm going to put a, 
a boat here, and uh, we'll put the aft over here, a little scoop. This is a boat that's moving away, so the masts are kind of closer together. And, but we still have a foresail, so we'll put that down. And uh, let's see. Something like that. It takes uh, some years of practice drawing boats to be able to draw them quickly, but I've had quite a bit of practice and it comes quickly. So there's, a, there's one boat that's moving away. Now, um, let's put one over here. Just kind of spreading them out a little bit. Remember, the reason we're putting boats in, one of the reasons is to give us a sense of space and atmosphere. And uh, having a few extra boats is, is, is good to help that. It also tells us a little bit of a story about the activity in this little harbor. Okay, so now we have the boats in and the general drawing is ready. I'm just going to spray it real quick with a little fixative and when that's dry, we'll get going. All right, well now we're, we're ready to start the underpainting and the objective here is to do a wash and then kind of tighten up a few things. Then we're going to let the painting dry overnight. The reason for that is so that the strong notes that are in the painting that are going to comprise the underpainting will be solid and they'll serve as the bones of our painting going forward. So first I'm going to take some Gamsol, which is basically odorless turpentine. Um, and I'm going to use this brush. This is one of those inexpensive brushes you can get at any hardware store. Um, I, I don't spend a lot of money on my on some of my larger brushes because I I find there's they're perfectly adequate to the task this way. This is not for fine careful stuff. This is just to get general washes in and, and you'll see what I mean in a minute. I'm just covering the canvas with a little thin wash of this Gamsol. Not much, just a little bit. If it gets too wet, I'm going to wipe it off. My reason for doing this is so that when I apply the color, it will be easy to move around. Because I, I don't know just how far I want to go with the lights and darks just yet. But all right. So now the, the canvas has a thin coat of Gamsol on it and uh, just a little bit damp, most of it. Now the next step is to take, I'm going to take some of this uh, transparent red oxide. I don't want to use too much. I probably have too much on, on this right now. Yeah, well, it is a little too much. So I'm going to wipe it off with my paper towel. I want something very thin here. Let me clarify what I'm talking about. This is a value scale. I want my general wash to be no darker than this right here, just a little under, under the white. And uh, to start things off, this is a little too dark. So I'm just going to spread this around and wipe it off here and there if I have to. That, that's more of what I'm going for, something like that. So it really doesn't take very much paint at this stage. Very, very light. And at this point, I'm not even adding more paint. I'm just moving around the paint that is already on the
canvas. And it's basically toning the, the whole canvas. That's more like it. All right, I need just a tiny bit more paint on there. I'm just going to touch that puddle of paint and look at how much I get out of that. Just a little, just a dab of that transparent red oxide. A little bit more down here. Now you'll remember from my value study that these are shadows and they're shadows because there's a slope here. Our light is up here in the sky and it's moving across the scene. It's casting shadows in this sand. These are dunes and this is the shadow side of the dune. So I'm just putting a little bit of darkness there. I don't want too much. That might be a little too much there. It just doesn't, it does not take too much paint for you to get too dark here. This is, I just want to suggest where, where the darks will be. I don't want to actually make them dark yet. I want to suggest where the darks will be. I don't want to make them dark yet. Here's a little bit of action in the sky so we can see where there might be a little bit of cloud activity. We don't have to keep that. We can move that around, but my instinct tells me I don't want to go too low on the horizon here. Uh, let me bring some of this color into the, into the water here. Notice how light this is. This is just a little bit of color. This is not too much. Now here's the part of the underpainting that matters even more than this. this. This is helpful, but it's not the whole story. What we really want to do is make sure that our boats are painted. Again, we're not going to put a lot of paint on them. It's not about making them dark. It's simply making sure that the, the uh, darkness is where it needs to be. The sails need to be darker than the sky, so we need to make a note of that. And we want to make sure the contour and the silhouette of these, the contours and the silhouettes of these boats are clear. So I'm just painting in these sails with some care to not go too dark. Remember, light is going to be coming through these sails. And it's very important that I not make them too dark. It's really about coloring in, really, the getting, getting these sails to be filled in with a, with a tone. That's the idea some tonality. I'm using a small flat brush for this. I think it's a number two. I'm going right up against the line and I know a lot of teachers say always color outside the lines, don't be so rigid about things, but you know, this is a painting of a boat and we do want to get the fundamentals of the boat in so that it's a convincing characterization of the boat. You don't have to be as 
precise as I'm being if you don't want to be, but that general shape, I think, works best if it's, if it's clear. Now for the bow of the boat, we can go a little darker there, but uh, we don't have to because, again, you know, this is not the final painting, but we just, we just want to make sure that we're making some commitments regarding the values going forward. Now I'm going to take some care with these other boats. This one in the, off to the left. And again, I'm just filling it in. Not going too dark. I know you, you, some, some of you may, some people may be asking, well, how dark are you going? Let's take a look at the value scale. Not too dark. I'm staying in, in basically this range for all of the painting right now. And here's this other boat over here. It got a little washed away. I guess it didn't spray it enough with some fixative, but. Just marking out where it's going to be. This one's going to be right near the, the brightest spot in the painting where all that sun is reflecting off the water. So it's going to be kind of faint anyway. I don't want to put too much effort into the values on that just yet. And uh, the next step is to bring, and I'm going to use a different brush for this. Sorry, I'm moving to another brush. Um, I'm taking a, uh, a number six round and I want to put some reflections under these boats. So I start with the solid part of the boat down here and I just drag it, drag this, this wash down, straight down under the boat. Just like that. And I don't, I'm not going to avoid the grasses. Go ahead and just bring it right into the grasses, which you can barely see anyway. We haven't put much in for the grasses and I don't want to yet. So I'm dragging the color right directly straight down into the water and that's how we get the reflection started. Like that. Well, believe it or not, this, this is about as almost as far as we're going to go. There's just one little, more little piece of this underpainting that I want to work on before calling it a day. And that's the background. There's a landmass back here. I want to make sure that I paint that in. Just with the same value range as the other parts of the painting. We're not going to go too dark. I just want to make sure that uh, we make a note of it. I'm going to use a mall stick to hold my arm steady here while I do this. The mall stick is easy to use. All you have to do is lean up one end of it onto the stable surface of the easel. And that's about, the rest of it is pretty self-explanatory. You just rest your arm on it while you paint and it, it helps you to stabilize your hand so you don't do a lot of wiggling around. If you drink a lot of coffee like me, you might, uh, you might really find the mall stick rather helpful. Again, I'm just marking out where the landmass is with this wash, this transparent red oxide wash. And this is going to be the brighter area, so I don't want to put too much paint there. We're going to preserve some of that brightness for later. And the landmass has, obviously, the bottom part of the landmass is the water. So that's a, gr a straight line. But the upper part, the upper line there, that, that wiggles around a lot because those are 
little trees and structures in the distance. And we don't have to get into all that just yet. We just have to mark it out. Another thing you need to know about painting anything when you're painting the water is to always make sure the water lines are straight. You'll remember that I put a very straight line on the bottom of this boat. I put a straight line on the bottom of this boat also over here. I, and I've got a straight line on the bottom of this landmass. Water that lies flat is more convincing. You certainly don't want to have water that kind of where the horizon line wobbles around. But uh, I don't like to have a, a I don't like to be iffy and unresolved about the edge of the horizon or the edge of the ocean or the edge of where the water is. It, it, gravity pulls it all down equally and straight. And so I think that's about all we need to get the underpainting underway here. We have the boats. We have a little activity in the sky. We're suggesting where the path is. I, I have almost nothing going on as far as marking out too much, but I have marked out where the darker parts are going to be. And I, I'm keeping it vague so I have the flexibility of going sharp or soft later. And I don't have to fight with what's under there for my underpainting. And that's another reason to keep the values high and to stay on the, on the uh, lighter register so that you're not uh, going to compete later on with some dark blob that you have to paint over because you've changed your mind. There's no dark blobs here. Everything is soft and workable. And that is the end of the underpainting. Now what we'll do is we're going to let it dry. And when it's dry, we're going to go in and put some color in this. And I'll show you finally how we can get light into these paintings. Hi, I'm Mark Shasha, and welcome to my workshop. I'm going to be spreading golden light across this scene just before twilight because I want to focus on the light and the textures more than the color. We're going to let the colors be muted in this painting. My workshop is unique because we are going to get more into how to paint sand than maybe you've experienced before. We're going to talk more about how to paint grass in a textural, natural way using really interesting tools that uh, may be new to you. I think this video will help enhance your painting skills whenever you want to do a landscape and put some light in it, or when you want to paint water and try to get that shine just right. I have lots of techniques that I'm going to be sharing in this video that will address those two things especially. I'm going to use color chips, a system that I've come up with to match the color and the value of what I'm seeing out there in nature. And then I can bring those colors and values directly into the studio. I'm also going to show you a technique to get boats into your paintings by using sketchbooks and some materials to transfer that onto your canvas directly. Some of these techniques may sound complicated, but I promise I do my best to make them simple for you so that you can use these techniques in any painting you want to do. So join me on this journey. Let's paint the beach. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plen Air Magazine. Welcome to Interviews with the Artist. Our guest today is an artist from the East. His name is Mark Shasha. Mark, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here with you. Well, I'm very interested in your career path and uh, everything about yourself as an artist. I like, uh, first off, I like your work. Thank I like you. your style. Um, you and I have met at the plein air convention. You're always the guy in the tuxedo, and I'm a little offended you didn't wear your tuxedo today. <laughs> well, I actually thought of it. I, I considered it. But, now, what, uh, tell me about that, because that's kind of become a trademark for you. What's the story behind that? 
Well, it's, first of all, I do it because it's fun, and I got into the habit of doing it because uh, I, I love people and it seems to attract people. When I'm out painting in a tuxedo, I seem to get lots of people come around, they check out my painting, they bring me donuts and coffee. Uh, I don't know. It's just it's it's a great conversation starter. Yeah. And here's the other thing: uh, if I'm doing a painting and it's not coming out well, um, wearing a tuxedo kind of makes it feel better. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is if uh, if the painting comes out well, I'm in a tuxedo. I'm ready to party. So it, <laughs> it's a win-win. <laughs> well, I, I you know I, I teach marketing for artists, and I think that every artist kind of needs a trademark, and and you've mm -hmm. kind of made that your own. It's you know it, it just, it's because yeah. when you're at the convention, the plein air convention, you see you're the only artist wearing mm -hmm. a tuxedo, and you're up there demoing and painting in a tuxedo, <laughs> and and uh, it, it gets a lot of attention. Now you were telling me mm -hmm. last night. Uh, about how this kind of all began. It had something to do with theater. Right. I do a lot of acting, and I, um, uh, you know, there's one theater in Marblehead where I do a lot of shows. And years ago, I would do shows, and, and we'd be in full costume, or, or, you know, especially a singing show where we're singing Cole Porter or, or something like that. And then there, I might not be in Act Two. Right. But I've got to come back out for the curtain call. Right. So what I would do is leave the theater for an hour while they're doing Act Two, and I'd be in my costume. I'd be in my if it was a tuxedo or whatever, and go to the nearby restaurant. And you know my waiter is already he knows I'm coming, and he's got my shrimp cocktail and a glass of wine waiting for me. And I sit <laughs> there and I read, I read the news and. Uh, but people would come up to me and say, "Well, aren't you overdressed? And what, what are you doing? Where are you going? What are you up to?" Right. And I would just say, well, I'm in a show. And they'd say, well, why aren't you in the show now? And I'd say, well, I'm in the show. It's, I just have to go back in a minute <laughs> for the curtain call because they're going uh, you know, to so, have cast call at the end. So that got into, I have another friend who, uh, who she and I go out and we dress up and we paint in the park. And in fact, I'm a member of the Guild of Boston Artists. And every summer, uh, Gene Lightman and I, who's the president, we... We go out and we uh, paint in the park, and I, I'm the only one that shows up in a tuxedo. But the, the whole point is, uh, people see us, they see me in my tuxedo, they come over, they ask us what we're doing, and it's a great outreach to the Boston community. We're in the Boston Public Garden, we're out painting, and we have extra easels for them. Oh, you so, do? Yeah, we have put paints out for people, and we, we teach, uh, we make it a day project, it's fun. I like I like hearing that because, as you know, I'm a big plein air enthusiast, oh, yeah. outdoor painting enthusiast. And when people come up to me when I'm out painting, yeah. uh, they they always say the same thing. They always say, "I wish I could do that, but I don't have any talent. I can't yeah. even draw a stick figure. It's almost like a script." Right. And I always say, "Yes, you can. You can do this. Let me show you how." And I'll say, "Come over here," and I'll I'll take their hand and I'll dip it in the mixture, mix a little color, and yeah. I'll take their hand and I'll. I'll make a, a streak. And I said, no, now you do that on your own. I yeah. said, you can't mess up my painting. Yeah. But what, what I try to do is to get people to have the light go off to realize, hey, I could do this. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's a great idea. I'm going to steal that idea. Yeah, you should because, I mean, we had a great story. There was a guy who used to work at Filene's basement in Boston. Yeah. And he had moved to another job and he had just had his last day of work. And he was walking through the public garden and he saw us out painting. And we had all these extra easels with canvases on them and everything and paints ready to go for anybody who wanted to stop by. And he said, what are you up to? We told him and we got him to start painting. He's still painting three years later. Really? And he sent us a lovely note about what it meant to him to just bump into us out painting that day. So we, I, I want to do painting in the park this summer. I've got a really busy schedule, but I'm uh, you know, we're talking about doing it again. I think I think that's really great, and and I love seeing that with adults and and also with kids. Yeah. And, and to see the light go off in their head that hey, I can do this. And, yeah, he and, had never and, done this. You know what? What I think is interesting is painting changes people's lives. Yeah. Now, how has painting changed your life? <laughs> oh, oh my! God. Wow, what a question. Well, you've been um, doing it for a long time. I've been an artist all my life. Yeah. I've been painting. It's the only thing I've ever really done is art right. Right. of various kinds. Um, well, you know, I, I like telling stories with my pictures. I like getting lost in my paintings. I think my artwork has always been me 
being very it's kind of I don't know it's like daydreaming and getting lost in whatever I'm creating and uh, I used to want to be a filmmaker for a while I like acting as you know and I I like uh, photography I had a little dark room when I was a kid I love science I love I am I am just uh, ravenous with muses I'm full of muses I want to I, 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 I there's desires to do things and uh, when I am painting I get all that kind of goes into the work it goes into this passion goes into it whether it's the beach which is a true amazing passion for me but it's not the suf the the, uh, the superficial quality of it it's the the marine biology that's in the water it's the flora and the fauna the science of of how the light is moving across the sand the physics of it I love the atmosphere. I'm fascinated with that. Um, and I'm also fascinated in the history of the place. What else happened on this beach? What's right. the, what, what boats have come up here or gone by before? And I don't know. I think painting is a way for me to live in all of that beauty and uh, try to make it happen in, in real life in, in a way. What I, what I have found is that uh, I, I can only speak to my own uh, experience, but mm -hmm. I became a much happier person once I started painting. And it was mm -hmm. almost like there had been something missing in my life. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what it was. I certainly never even considered painting as an option. Yeah. And that's why I'm so driven to get people outdoors painting because, you know, a, a lot of us are not outdoorsy type people. Right. I mean, I've never been an athlete. I've, I've, you know, I might do some hiking or fishing, but I've never been that person who was always outdoors. Yeah. But by getting outdoors and painting, you see things differently. So yeah. you mentioned that you had been a photographer. Yeah, I like photography. A and I, I was a photographer, and mm -hmm. I realized that I, I would fly all the way across the world to get a shot of something mm -hmm. iconic. And I'd set up, I'd do that shot 20 minutes later, Maybe 10 minutes later, I'm on to the next thing. It's like that Chevy Chase movie, yeah. Vacation, where they drive all the way across the country, they get to the Grand Canyon, and he goes, right? <laughs> yeah, and, right. And, and so, um, yeah. but, but uh, painting slows mm -hmm. us down. Right. You know, now all of a sudden, instead of spending 10 minutes in a location, you're mm -hmm. spending two, three, four hours, yeah. and you see things differently, don't you? Oh, my gosh, yeah. I mean... Um... I have a show opening up in Boston at the Guild of Boston Artists this summer, which is going to be, a, a, the title of it is Breaking for Beauty, which is what I do. I see that as my life. I stop, I want to pause, I want to look, I take a break and I trust my instinct that there's something here that has now stopped me and attracted me and I want to pursue it and explore it and I want to find out what it is, but it takes time. I set up and I'm like, hmm, I don't really know all the time what it is that's that's hooked me right and as I say to my students beauty can be obvious or it could just be some truth that's under the surface that's getting you and I also find that you know getting back to painting as a, a way to express yourself I mean uh, as an artist I've all everything I've done I didn't even realize this till a few years ago but I, everything about me is expression hmm. I love acting because I like to express myself. I love to paint because I like to express myself. And um, I sing, I play guitar, and I, I've done these things professionally because, um, I don't know, I think that's, that's the thing in me is to express. And I think it brings peace to people when they find out that they can express themselves. That's why an art education is so crucial. Because if you don't have an art education, if you don't know how to express yourself, you're going to be frustrated in life. You're going to find things, you're going to want to say something about it. You won't be able to articulate it because painting is a language. It's not just a language to, you don't, you don't only learn to speak that language, but you have to learn to listen to it and hear it when, you, when it's being spoken. So let's talk about that art education piece, yeah. because I think that's something that mm -hmm. that probably intimidates a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, if someone watching us right now is thinking, um, well, maybe I should try this painting thing. Mm -hmm. Where do they begin? What what is the process you'd recommend? You, you know, you had the benefit of 
a lifetime of doing this, yeah. but as you were to, as you look back now and yeah. you and you teach a lot of students, yeah. uh, what are the essentials that they've absolutely got to get down, and how do they even go about doing that? Well, first off, I have a, a, an answer to that because I have lots of workshop students who were uh, did something else their whole life, and then at the age of fifty or something, they decided, you know, they'd like to try this painting thing, and I'm all for that. I love that, and I think what you do is. If you're in that situation, um, just pick up the paint and start doing it. And don't care what anyone thinks. Don't try to judge yourself harshly. D don't do that. Just if you like the color red, paint red today. Uh, it, just have fun mm -hmm. and uh, don't worry about it. Then as you go along and you start thinking and, and, and let the muses start to kick in. Oh, wait a minute. I, I've been painting red, but I'd like to paint a red rose. Now you start to do a little inquiring about how do I paint a rose? What do I do there? And there's lots of material as you've provided a bunch of them with artists all over the place. Start doing a little, uh, when you're ready, start learning a little bit about how to do this. And it's not, it's not hard. The first steps are easy. You can start with sketching and ha just have fun. You know, we tend to beat ourselves up. All right. uh -huh. and I, I can recall um, some friends of mine who signed up for an art class I recommended that I was in, yeah. and, uh, but at a different time. And they, and they went to one lesson and mm -hmm. they just said, this is too frustrating, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. We beat ourselves up. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we think that there is this natural talent that we're born with, and we tell ourselves that we don't have that natural talent. Do you mm -hmm. believe that there is such a thing as natural talent? And do you believe that someone who doesn't have natural talent can learn to paint. I think someone who has no experience at all with painting or any inclination to paint can pick up paint and find out that they love it and they want to do it. I don't, I don't know about talent. I think we'd certainly, there are people, and uh, I thought I was one of them, I'm not sure I am, who has an, a, a propensity for this, an inclination, an ability to do it sort of naturally. I don't think there's anything natural. I think. Um, well, maybe there is, uh, but what I what I find a lot is that sometimes people think they want to be artists when all they really want to be is free. They want to be free to follow their dream or the thing they love, and so they think artist is the be art be an artist is to do that. Um, and I think everyone should try to be an artist if that's what they want to try. Um, and don't be intimidated by what you don't know. You know, uh, it's really, uh, it's a lovely discovery. It's a journey. And you can take it as far as you want to go. And you mentioned before, you know, we beat ourselves up about it. Yeah. Well, what happens with some of us is that the more we paint, we want to paint better. And we want to be better. We want to, because ultimately it's about freedom. It, wouldn't it be wonderful? If I could paint like a, I don't know, a John Singer Sargent, just take my paints and paint whatever I want to paint, wouldn't that be just so free? If I picked up a guitar and I could play every chord, I could express myself perfectly. And I, I, that's the goal. That's the holy grail. So we fight. So yeah, I, want, I would love that level of freedom. But I think not everybody, you know, is that's why I beat myself well, up when it's not perfect. Well, I want and, it to and, be and perfect. And here's, here's, the, here's the rub. We uh, will go to a surgeon. Yeah. And we don't believe for a second that a surgeon has natural talent. He or she may have uh, a special ability to take it a little further than that, that other person. Yeah. But they went to school, they went to college, they yeah. went to grad school, they mm -hmm. went to medical school, then they went to their yeah. specialty thing. And, right. and so they've spent 20 years, 30 years learning their craft. We, uh, we, we know that if you go to Carnegie Hall mm -hmm. and you listen to a great pianist, we know that that pianist started out with piano lessons, learning you know, Mary had a little lamb and learning the keyboard and trying things over and over again. And we know that there's a process that these people have to follow. Yet there's this belief 
that with artists, you should just be able to walk up to a canvas and paint a beautiful painting. <laughs> and, and the thing I always try to get across to people is this is a learned process. Yeah. Now, there is talent that some people absolutely have oh, where no they question. can take it to the next level. But you and I know hundreds of very proficient, very good painters who make a living as painters yeah. who don't have that special talent. Yeah. <clears throat> and, you know, the reality is there's there's a very few people who can have that extra 2% of talent that mm -hmm. takes them to, you know, to being yeah. at the level of a uh, Richard Schmidt or, a, right. you know, uh, uh, somebody, somebody of that nature. Well, <clears throat> you know, maybe this is it, too. Is it Malcolm Gladwell wrote that great book about the title's escaping me, but it's about, you know, 10,000 hours doing a thing. Right, right. Uh, and I think that gets to do with passion. I mean, if you're a kid and you're passionate, I mean, I, I can tell you what happened to me. I, I was, my mother was a bit of a painter. She'd do a little plein air painting long, this was in the, in the 60s and, and 70s. She did plein air painting. A little bit of outdoor painting. She did indoor too, but I remember <laughs> her painting outside in Woodstock, uh, Vermont years ago. We used to have a ski house and I'm a downhill skier. And we, uh, she'd be out there painting, and, and I have this memory of her, and I still have some of her tubes of paint. And every once in a while, I put a little on my palette. It's, uh, she's got the, the original uh, manganese blue, by the way, which is hard to get now. Uh, so I got a tube of that. Uh, but uh, where I was going is that one day, she took me to the Mystic Outdoor Art Festival. I was about seven or eight, maybe eight years old, something like that. And there was an artist who was... Um, at the easel, just out at the festival, doing these amazing, to me, dunes, just dune paintings with these moody skies and seagulls flying. And, you know, today I might, you, we'd call it kitsch, you know, but it was because very predictable. But I, I just was blown away. And I saw him take this very thin brush and make these brush strokes to make the grass. And I just couldn't wait to get home to try that with my oil paints that my mm. grandmother had given me. And I remembered the, la the, the guy's last name was Noble. But years later, when the internet came along and I started looking for his name, I would type in Noble Artist and I would just get these paintings of kings and queens. And stuff. <laughs> it didn't work. And I didn't know how to get, I couldn't get further than that. He wasn't a famous painter. And a couple years ago, I was in Provincetown, where I go all the time with my wife. And I was out painting uh, the National Seashore. I go back to the room where we, my wife had arranged this hotel room. And over the bed, there was one of those old prints going blue, fading and old. Right. And I knew right from the door, oh, that's a noble. Mm -hmm. And I walked up, and I'm getting goosebumps even talking about it. And I finally saw his name. Dana Gibson Noble. And I looked him up. I saw more about him. I learned about his life a little bit. I think that was a huge influence in my life. Sure. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. But, you know, it's whether he had talent, I don't know. <clears throat> uh, whether I had talent, I don't know. But I know that the passion, that's, that was what drove me to paint and draw. And, and I wanted to write I wanted to write movies. I wanted to take do do film. I wanted my passions. I got way too many passions. Oh, well, that's I'm, a nice thing to I'm have. I'm jiggling in my and, seat. And, and about... see, I, I think too. Going back to this talent discussion, yeah. I think that talent really is passion. Yeah. That it it's you know that that kid who can draw really really well. Yeah. I remember in the <clears throat> fourth grade. Yeah. A kid next to me could draw really really well, mm -hmm. and I thought this guy's got talent. Well, what I didn't realize is that he sat there hours and hours and yeah. hours and copied things and learned and yeah. drew. And that that's where mm -hmm. that talent comes in. It's practice, it's passion to pra you know, for practice and so on. Well, I, I think that it's really interesting to see that influence. I, I have similar experiences and that's why I think that, you know, when you're outdoors painting and you hand the brush to somebody, you might have just changed their life. Yeah. And, and I think that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So um, what are your, uh, what are the influences on your career that you think have had a, a huge impact on taking yourself to the next level in terms of either living or deceased artists? Oh, wow. That's just a really long list. Um, uh, 
Well, there are some obvious ones. Uh, the Dana Gibson Noble story that I just told you. Um, uh, David Levine, who used to do uh, illustration for the New York Times, uh, not the New York Times Book Review, but the New York Review of Books. Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, my father had those stacks, and I would just go through and see his extraordinary um, caricatures. And he used to do these pen and ink things, and I, of course, had pen and ink, and I, I tried to copy all of them. I love uh -huh. doing these cross hatches and stuff. He was, that's a big, inf pardon me, influence. But I was also very influenced by Jacques Cousteau. Jacques, Jacques Cousteau? Yeah, Jacques Cousteau was not known or thought of as an artist, but what a cinematographer, what a storyteller, what an explorer. His love of the world, his love of science, and he was a heck of a poet. If you listen to his, the way he wrote about, you know, uh, love and loss of, of beautiful parts of the world, beautiful parts of the ocean. You know, the poets have always, you know, known the sort of forlorn, you know, that, that ache. Um, and then when I got to the Rhode Island School of Design, I, I did have um, an extraordinary, several uh, extraordinary mind-expanding things. Uh, one big influence for me was... Um, well, one, one that blew me away was Joseph Albers, who was a protege of... Uh, well, he taught at the Rhode Island School, didn't he? Uh, well, Joseph Albers didn't teach there, but um, Cy Silman did, who was Silman one did. of his uh, protégés. Okay, because Albers, Albers taught somewhere. I, I don't well, remember. he was at the Bauhaus, oh, and okay. yeah, I think he, he went to <clears throat> Yale later, but um, Cy Silman uh, from the Bauhaus uh, blew my mind with color. I mean, he just would take a red. He'd ask the class. He'd hold up the color red. He'd say, what color is that? And we'd say, red, red. Everybody would say, red. it's obviously red. Then he'd put it against something, another color, and it immediately turned green. Just turned green right in front of your eyes. And that just was mind-blowing. Right, that whole comparison thing. Oh, yeah. And then, we, then I had Chris Van Allsburg for a teacher. Uh, and But, I mean, I had this, that's a, a, another story we could talk about of, of my diversion into graphic design, which was a train wreck and didn't go well. <laughs> you know, because I discovered that, that graphic design is all about simplifying something complicated. And I didn't want to do that. I didn't realize till I was in it that I didn't want to do that. I want to take, I wanted to be an illustrator where you take something simple and you complicate it, make it interesting. Um, a different way of thinking, but that's a diversion. But I, I ended up uh, going to a class where uh, a young teacher at the time, Chris Van Allsburg, had just uh, published a book called The Garden of Abdul Ghazazi, and he was transforming the publishing world with children's books because, um, you know, it was early days, but tr there was a transformation in the world of illustration. Illustration was leaving magazines and sort of where it normally was, and illustrators were looking for a new place to draw. And Chris Van Allsburg, uh, who was a writer and a, a, a great illustrator, um, was doing these really intense, beautiful drawings. And, you know, I love movies. I wanted to make movies, but this was like making movies without having to worry about collaborating with anybody. Right. You could just write your little story and, and draw your pictures. And I was full of ideas for stories. So when, having Chris Van Allsburg for a teacher, uh, he was just, uh, I could go on and on. It was a really extraordinary experience. And of course, he went on to do Jumanji and the Polar Express. And um, he was working on, I don't know, he had only done three books when I was at RISD. And now, of course, he's done dozens of books, I think. I don't know. I'm not. In terms of uh, historic painters, is there a particular painting mm -hmm. that if, there was no limitation on your budget and yeah. there was you could pick up the phone and call any museum in the yeah. world and say i want that painting delivered to my house on thursday yeah is there a painting the fountain by um, john singer Sargent. it was at uh, the uh, art institute of uh, chicago i um i've had this kind of experience and i again i get goosebumps talking about this might even get a little teary <laughs> uh I was in Chicago for my cousin who, who was having a, a, some issues and I was visiting with her and um, I was just there for a week and I had never been to the Art Institute. Uh, oh, so this was, this was about oh, 15 years ago. No, it blows so away. I, so I, I was walking through and I'm blown away and these are so exciting. It's so exciting to be there. 
what wonderful paintings. I go into the American wing, I go into the John Singer Sargent room here, and I take a left under some door or under, I remember an archway, but there may not have been one. I may be, that may be embellishment, but I took a left and I looked and I saw the fountain. That's the painting where there's a man leaning in as a woman is sitting on the edge of a fountain and she's uh, painting at an easel and there's the fountain going on behind them and then behind that is a big dark tree. I stood there for three hours studying that painting. I, I, I had seen it in books, I had seen it all my life and I swear it looked like John Singer Sargent had taken a br one brush stroke and just gone like that and an entire that woman's hand was all right there in that brush stroke fingers uh, fingernails it, 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 I, I just couldn't understand how could he do it I, I've told my students you know John Singer Sargent is like the the Jimi Hendrix of painting because <laughs> we have just like Jimi Hendrix we have the instrument we know how many we know where the strings are there's a limited number of places you can put your fingers, right? We have John Singer Sargent's palette. We know what paints he used. We have his brushes. Nobody can do this. <laughs> it's just, there are some, uh, yeah, and you know, talk, talk about talent. I mean, come on. He just, he just knew what to do. And you just wonder, think of the freedom of that and the passion for that. I mean, just. That was his sister. I yeah. believe who was painting that he did that right. painting yeah. of, and yeah. uh, uh, who was the grandmother of Richard Ormond, who uh, is the great historian on Sargent. Yeah, um, I, yeah. Well, I, I should I, say I've gone out to drinks with George uh, Sargent up in Boston, yeah. uh, who's his great great nephew or something. Really? Yeah, and he's got stories about John Singer Sargent that nobody's heard. Yeah, I bet that that'd be fascinating. It is. Yeah, I, th I think the same would be true of Ormond. You know, they yeah. have their internal family stories and so mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. If, if uh, uh, you were able to get an hour over drinks with yeah. Sergeant, yeah. what do you think you'd ask him? Oh, I would just, I know it would be hopeless to try to pump him for information. I mean, I wouldn't do that. I just I wouldn't say, oh, how did you, how did you? I, I don't think I would. I, I would just, uh, I, I think I'd want to know what drove him to, not, to paint so many portraits and not do more uh, Venice watercolors. You know, he, you know, he got to the point where he hated doing portraits. Yeah, then he called them his portraits. But it's so, uh, I, yeah, I don't know why he, I don't, that's the mystery to me is I don't know, I don't know what his muses were. Imagine being so, so gifted and to not kind of share what you're, you know, you can kind of see it as what he painted. Well, well, according to Ormond, who I spoke with recently about this very subject, um, he, Sargent had become passionate about watercolor. Yeah. He would not sell his watercolor paintings. Uh, he did them for his pleasure because he was trying to get away from the portraiture, which had, he loved initially, but he had gotten to the point where it became, it was just a living. Yeah. And, you know, he had to go through that. To make to make a living, but what what a beautiful job he did! And you have the benefit living in Boston oh, yeah. of the the library downtown and the and the murals which yeah, took the him. Yeah, the too. Was that twenty five years or something that he took to to do? Yeah, those. the murals at the Boston Public Library. Yes. Um, yeah, they're not my favorite ones that he's done, but yeah. you can go to the, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. And yes. That's Sargent's oh. home away from home. Well, and he has, so what is the one, the, the flamenco dancer? Right. Uh, it's right That's around there. the corner in that Very dramatic. grotto. Yeah. yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, Isabella Stewart Gardner didn't really take, at least the, the, the building wasn't a good place for the paintings because there's a lot of dampness and she had a lot of gardens. I mean, that area where, she, where the flamenco painting is, uh, she had ferns originally all around it and like used it as a garden you know like a like a like a greenhouse yeah so it's not really a good you know they had to repair the painting a little bit she's kind of my muse oh yeah i i just think she was a remarkable person who oh, you think yeah. that if you, you look back i mean you and i have the pleasure of hanging out with people who will be yourself included mm -hmm. but 
people who will go down in history as painting legends. Mm. To us, they're just our buddies that we'll have drinks over. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that Gardner kind of got to the same way. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, she was, uh, she had these people as guests in her home. Of course, she had money. She could do right. commission work. But mm. the stories of her with Zorn or, or with mm. Sargent or with all, you know, Soroy, all the greats. Mm -hmm. And uh, what a great um, thing that she's done. And mm. I, I, I love and admire people like that yeah. who who, you know, there are a lot of people who have money who do nothing with it. Mm -hmm. Here's a, a person who did something that has a lasting effect on the arts community for, you know, for hopefully yeah. hundreds of years beyond her death. Well, I think the other thing about her, I mean, she had a joy. She just, she found the joy in a great piece of art. And really, you know, that was... Um, I think that's what was her fuel, and she loved talking about art, and she loved yeah. poetry, she loved, uh, and this is one thing that I don't think artists talk enough about, is the joy of it all. Yeah. I mean, whether you got talent or not, do you enjoy what you're doing? Because if, you if, if there's joy in it, you've got to do it, and just You very rarely ever do you meet an unhappy artist. Very rarely. I mean, once right. in a while you get a grumpy person, but, but yeah. these are people who are doing exactly what they want to do. Yeah. And by the way, it's not an easy life. No, but it's not a it's not an easy uh, um, it's not a good way to make a living, but it's a great way to live. That's how I think about painting and a life of art. It's very profound. You know, it's not a good way to make a living. And I, as I say to young artists, you know, I can't promise you that you're going to make any money or have any success at this, but I can promise you it's worth it. Hi, I'm Mark Shasha, and welcome to my workshop. I'm going to be spreading golden light across this scene just before twilight because I want to focus on the light and the textures more than the color. We're going to let the colors be muted in this painting. My workshop is unique because we are going to get more into how to paint sand than maybe you've experienced before. We're going to talk more about how to paint grass in a textural, natural way using really interesting tools that uh, may be new to you. I think this video will help enhance your painting skills whenever you want to do a landscape and put some light in it or when you want to paint water and try to get that shine just right. I have lots of techniques that I'm going to be sharing in this video that will address those two things especially. I'm going to use color chips, a system that I've come up with to match the color and the value of what I'm seeing out there in nature. And then I can bring those colors and values directly into the studio. I'm also going to show you a technique to get boats into your paintings by using sketchbooks and some materials to transfer that onto your canvas directly. Some of these techniques may sound complicated, but I promise I do my best to make them simple for you so that you can use these techniques in any painting you want to do. So join me on this journey. Let's paint the beach. <laughs>